The Royal Navy is at all times equipped for war and may need to go into action without the time for special preparations. It follows that weapons must be totally reliable. Any impediment or accident which reduces that reliability or risks the safety of our ships and men threatens the heart of the Navy and the nation. The complexity and variety of weapons in today's Navy mean that early planning and preparation are essential when ammunitioning ship. The biggest task is the embarkation of a full outfit, and this forms a model for most other smaller operations. Ideally, the planning process should begin some six to eight weeks before the proposed embarkation date, and in any case, not less than four weeks in advance. For a full outfit, the requirement is, of course, known to RNAD, and therefore demands are not necessary. But for a replenishment, exact requirements must be specified. What I want to move on to the rules for the embarkation of explosives are contained in Naval Magazine and Explosives Regulations, NMERs. There's a probable ammunitioning date. To get on the sort of way ahead, John, as uh, Jeff is away on leave, if you will act as the RNAD liaison man, and then Jeff, when you come back from leave, if you'll produce the draft next year and be with me by the 22nd of July. Right, gentlemen, are there any other points? Two weeks' notice should be regarded as the minimum for any replenishment involving a crane lighter, and at least five working days for minor quantities alongside. Depot staff will always respond to urgent requests at short notice, but they can only do so if most requirements are specified well in advance. Hi. Meeting depot staff also helps to avoid yes, problems. No problems at all. Ray Hugel will be coming over to the ship tomorrow to discuss lightridge. Mm. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks, John. See you then. Meetings also enable them to start making their own early plans for stores and any special facilities. Preparations carried out in a ship are shown in NMER and must include a thorough check of all magazines and lockers to ensure that they'll be ready before ammunitioning day. These are a few examples of typical faults. Missing equipment. Loose fittings. Missing spray guards and wrong keys. Out-of-date contents boards, damage control marking and test tallies. Unmaintained or missing handling gear. Hello, Ray. John said he'd be on board sometime this morning. Meanwhile, the ship and depot staffs continue to work closely together, discussing such things as the handling of the lighters and the sequence in which the different stores will be unloaded from the lighters into the ship. The armament depot has the task of preparing ammunition for issue to ships and submarines. Stores like these Mark 24 torpedoes require considerable time to prepare them. Simpler stores are more easily prepared and handled, but their physical security presents a problem. Guided weapons are very delicate and must be carefully examined before being packed in a protective container to await dispatch. Assembly and test is monitored to ensure that the completed weapon is both safe and reliable. Coastal armament depots are often sited near built-up areas and so are limited by the amount of explosive material which can be held at any one time. Ships' requirements may have to be brought in from other depots, usually by rail, in trains which have been specially prepared and secured. The stores may then have to be taken through the preparation process before they can be issued to the ship. All of this takes time and very careful coordination. 
With two weeks to go, it's time to make a signal formally requesting permission to embark the ammunition. That explosive quantity is 2,760 kilograms, sir. Thank you very much, Chief. This would enable the port authorities to coordinate the activities planned for the various ships in the area. John Lyman's in the tower. Good morning. Hello, John. We just had a signal from Andromeda, who wants to embark two extra Seawolf on the 8th of August. Um, can you do that? Seawolf on the 8th of August? Right, well... What I'll do is I'll come back to you in about 10 minutes. Can I speak into the pier, John? OK, thanks very much. Bye. Back in the ship, work must continue to discover the niggling little faults which may have been missed earlier to check the efficiency of handling gear and to ensure that it is in date for test. To check that missing items have been replaced. It's also important to ensure that work which is still in progress will be completed on time. Oh, that's good. How's the job going? Oh, not too bad. Not too slow. Do you think we're going to finish before ammunition? Well, I should think so. Yeah. Good. Other departments within the ship must be told well in advance of what has already been planned and how they will be involved. Remember, embarking ammunition is a whole ship event. This is best done at a planning meeting. The ammunition sorted out. Firstly, the move times. Uh, we will move at 0745 that morning, which means we'll need to expire leave early as we normally do, Chief getting people in at about 0720 to harbour stations uh, to be ready in all respects to move up harbour at 0745, coming back alongside at about 1700 that night. We're looking to three lighters, two forward, one aft, which will mean all the junior rates, uh, clear lower deck of all junior rates, and then uh, working them right through the lunch hour if necessary. But Jeff, I know the XTM has now been seen by the majority of the coordinators, but what I would like to do now is to run through it with you uh, to clear up any last minute points that come out of it. All right, sir. The plan is to embark SUDAP missiles from two lighters forward and to embark 4-5 ammunition and the balance from one lighter aft. Uh, it means humping lots of 4-5 ammunition. The XTM is distributed after the details have been finalised at the HODS meeting. Before ammunitioning day, the rules require the explosives responsible officer to inspect all his magazines to ensure that they are fully fit to receive ammunition. That looks okay to me, Chief. Any other problems? No response, no, sir. Well, in that case, we can bring ammunition. This is the point. first of the regular daily inspections which must now be carried out. Magazines are often quite complex compartments, and it's sensible to include the appropriate forms in the S2100 series as part of the detailed inspection guide to this first formal inspection. At this point, the regular inspections of adjacent compartments must also be started. And the explosives log and the daily record of inspection must be brought back into use. Ammunition routes are prepared in accordance with NMER and should be carefully checked to ensure that first aid firefighting equipment is in place and that no hazards exist for men carrying heavy or awkward loads. We all know what happens when things are not properly checked. Murphy wrote a law about it. As part of the pre-embarkation checks, the weapons and marine engineer officers must ensure that the magazine equipment and services for which they are responsible are in good order and are in date for test. These include, for example, fans and air conditioners, tank top manhole covers and, of course, spraying systems and fire alarms. These checks also are signed for in the daily record of inspection. Finally, when all the advance work has been completed, the men who will be in charge of the various ammunition parties must be right, properly briefed. Gentlemen. As you're aware, we're ammunitioning tomorrow. We're going to, have to be taking on a full outfit. We've been in dockyard hands for a very long while, and there's a lot of people on board who are not sure what the procedures are, and it must be done correctly. 
You should all by now have read the XTM, so you certainly all know, as officer of the quarters and as senior officer in charge of the section, what your... Tomorrow, all the work and planning of the last six weeks will be put to the test. Preparations which could not be made previously are made early on ammunitioning day. Placing heaving lines and fenders, shot mats and fire hoses, and, if they'll be needed, earth bonding straps. If, despite all the precautions, an explosive is dropped, it will be safer if it falls onto a flat surface than onto a spigot such as a hatch stanchion. Such projections should be padded. When the ship reaches the ammunitioning berth, it seems that everything must happen at once, but nothing must be missed. The lighters are ready to come alongside. The ammunition parties must be ready for them. Ammunition parties is detailed on the flight deck. Listen to your names. Harold Holtby. Warning signals must be hoisted and warning pipes made. The appropriate RADHAS keys must be placed on the hazard state board and a last check made of magazine and adjacent compartment inspections. Part of ship seamen, stand by to secure ammunition by that Before some weapons can be handled, the ship and lighter must be electrically bonded. But fire hoses are always required, both to the dump area and to the lighter. Once the lighter is alongside, the ship becomes responsible for the conduct of the whole operation and must provide competent crane controllers who are identified by a red cuff, as well as checkers to note the numbers of packages as they arrive. And of course, the muscle power and expertise necessary for handling the stores. Armament depot representatives will be on board to offer advice as necessary. They will also warn of possible problems. A marine services representative will provide the crane certificate and conduct a load test. According to BR 932, the ammunition handbook, 458 rounds weigh about 47 kilos apiece in their protective tanks, and they are cumbersome. Nevertheless, they must be handled carefully and not bumped about. Although ammunition parties should not normally wear gloves when handling electrically exploded devices, especially bare stores. They are an acceptable protection when handling GRP containers. Anti-flash hoods provide the same protection to the neck. The tanks are interlocking and so must be stowed the right side up. When embarking ammunition alongside, a second controller will be needed in the lighter to take charge of the initial lift because of the limited view of the crane controller and driver. The crane driver's view into the ship is also limited, so the controller must take firm charge and ensure that the load is hoisted no higher than is necessary and is traversed in safety. As the load is lowered, steadying lines are used to stop any swing or turning of the load before it's guided to the deck. Once on deck, the missile container is opened up and the shock tab indicator is checked. The missile is given a visual examination to ensure that it has not been subjected to undue stresses in transit. The whole task of checking, manoeuvring, unboxing and stowing of large weapons like sea dart must be firmly directed and controlled Slowly. if accidents and damage are to be avoided. 2-6, on first time. 2-6, heave. Confirm, crate on
ammunition parties secure for lunch, sentries as detailed. Okay, put it down, mate. Put that one down. Put it down. Ammunition dumps are never to be left unattended. Okay, right, back at 12.30 then, where you go. Now the detonators are arriving. They are always embarked in a special container, the det tank. Detonators need special care in handling and must be carried down vertical ladders in a secure haversack, never in the hand. Boxes which are to be stowed in a deep magazine usually have to be lowered on a whip. Three things are important here. First, that there is sufficient manpower to control the whip. Second, that the whip is secured around the box and through the handles. And the third we've already seen. Pad any projections. If stores are being hoisted, Miller's flaps must also be fitted. Boxed stores such as these pyrotechnics, which are going into an upper deck pyro magazine, are more easily handled. But they still require the same care in stowing. And of course, checking. Stores which cannot be kept in their boxes, like these three-inch RE rockets, must be unpacked and handled bare, and that makes them more vulnerable to all sorts of physical damage. Get you put the packing back in the box. Any explosive store, boxed or bare, which is accidentally damaged, however slightly, must be set aside and reported to the officer in charge. Firing a damaged weapon could have serious consequences, and it takes a very special kind of person to assume that damage is not worth reporting. Accidents are very easily caused. This crane driver cannot see the load, and although the controller is signalling to hoist, his attention has been distracted. Just imagine what might have happened if the driver had not stopped his crane. Working areas must always be kept clear and uncluttered if accidents are to be avoided. This may only be a drill torpedo, but that makes no difference. And what did it bump into? The war shot? I'm not too happy with that. Remember that a crane driver's view is very limited, and he must rely on the crane controller. This controller has the load too close to the superstructure, too high, and finally traverses it over the explosives. Why on earth didn't he start the dump from aft? One factor which can seriously affect an ammunitioning event is the weather. Ammunition should not be embarked or disembarked in the rain unless the commanding officer decides that it is necessary. If a thunderstorm is likely, stop everything and lower the crane jibs. When all ammunition is stowed and accounted for, the stowages must be properly secure against any possible movement of the ship. Some stores, like the 458 tanks, are self-stacking and others fit the racks, but even they must be checked. Finally, the explosives responsible officer should ensure that all the magazines are inspected and secured and that the lighters have been towed away before the ship can move back to her normal berth or put to sea. So far, we've only looked at one type of ship and the weapons appropriate to her. Although the basic preparations are the same, other ships with different weapon fits may need different equipment and use varied procedures. Embarking exoset may require the use of a large floating crane, but the standard preparations are still necessary. Controlling the crane is still the ship's responsibility, and the loads are handled just as carefully. Once the weapon is on board, though, the checking and securing procedures are special to Exocet. Seawolf is embarked by crane lighter, or the ammunition berth crane, as are most stores. It is unboxed and examined on receipt.
The missile is heavy and it is delicate and must be moved from the dump to the magazine hoist very carefully in its handling frame. Some minor war vessels, like this mine hunter, have very special problems. To start with, all the handling equipment must be non-magnetic. It does not follow that small ships always carry small weapons. These remotely controlled mine disposal weapons weigh in at 126 kilos, and most of that is explosive. They are made from glass-reinforced plastic, which could easily be cracked if they were handled carelessly. In a ship which is also of GRP construction, another problem is controlling the discharge of static electricity, which requires the use of a special circuit, the tree. Submarines do not have such an extensive range of different weapons as most surface ships. Some weapons, like these pyrotechnics, can be embarked loose by passing them from hand to hand. But it requires careful consideration to place the men so that both they and the stores will be safe. FSS, Roger. The submarine's main weapons, torpedoes, are much more difficult to deal with. There is only one possible method of embarkation, and that is very carefully laid down in torpedo and weapon operating procedures, usually called TWAPs. TWAPs cover everything, from the initial weapon checks and weapon dressing in the lighter, through to the final stowage of the torpedo in the rack. Stone Mark 24 in the rack selected. Roger. Stand by and place in stone stops. In stone stops. Stop! There are also twops for the other submarine weapons, oh, such table. as this Mark V mine. Stand by and press. Stand by and press. Stand by and take away on the press. Stand by and take away. Up slow on a press, up slow on a press. Get a weapon level, get a weapon fore and aft. TWAPs also cover other classes of submarine, for example this SSN embarking a spearfish torpedo. In a CVS, the very size and shape of the ship poses problems. Because of the height of the flight deck, mobile cranes may have to be used. These cranes must be fitted with spark-proof exhaust systems, be fully supported, and be secure to the deck. Very wide cats are also needed to position the lighters. The crane driver cannot see the lighter, and so the controller in the ship must act on signals from his assistant in the lighter. Notice how the load is lifted just clear of the lighter and is traversed to an overwater position before the final lift to the flight deck. This is the safe way to do the job.
Replenishment in harbour is the most common way of embarking ammunition, but by no means is it the only way. A second method used at sea, especially where relatively small quantities of ammunition are involved, is the vertical replenishment, or vertrep. In a vertrep, helicopters are used to transfer stores from ship to ship or shore to ship. But because of the nature of some weapons, not all stores can be transferred in this way. BR-932 shows the replenishment methods which may be used for the various weapons in service. In a vertrep, one of the problems in the receiving ship is actually handling the large pallets and getting them away from the dump area to be unpacked. And so the first load over is usually two pallettrons, which are small wheeled lifting trucks. It's important that the dump area be cleared quickly, ready for the next load to be brought in. But it is also very important that nobody approaches the dump until told to do so by the flight deck officer. Vertrepping is a very useful way of embarking stores quickly, but as with all other methods of replenishment, it must be planned in advance to allow the supplying ship time to assemble the stores and pack them into crates or pallets. When the load is lowered, any possible build-up of static electrical charge is first drained off by using an earthing pole. Only when the helicopter has lifted clear may the load be moved. A third method of embarking ammunition is by replenishment at sea, usually referred to as RAS A. As in the vertrep, the stores must be pre palleted and they will arrive quickly, so keeping the dump area clear is important. Once on deck, the pallet must be moved away before being unpacked, leaving the dump area ready for the next load. It is possible to return ammunition to an RFA by back RAS, but because such stores cannot be reissued until they've been subjected to an armament depot examination, it's only approved in exceptional circumstances. The usual way of disembarking ammunition is in harbour. The necessary preparation, planning and handling of the stores is very much the same as for an embarkation. The essential difference is, of course, that the stores are being packed or crated instead of being unpacked. Don't forget to ask well in advance for all the empty packages which will be needed. The stores should be checked for accounting purposes as they leave the ship, 
and this is particularly important where stores considered as useful to the ill-disposed are concerned. UID stores should be checked by both the ship staff and an armament depot representative, and a receipt issued to the ship. Number 80, number 80. What do you make it? Uh, Debt number 80, 100. 100, yeah, that's correct. Right, OK, I'll sign that voucher off for you. UID stores are normally transported separately from the other stores, usually by fleet tender, and will be accounted for at all stages of their journey into the depot. When explosives are returned to the depot, they will be taken into store, examined, tested, refurbished, and then packed for reissue, ready for the next ship to start the whole ammunitioning cycle all over again. 